um, having me. And uh, we are going to hopefully take this time to interview you because you do instructional design for a living, but you do it in the corporate realm. And we've heard a lot about it in a sense from the teachers because the teachers always practice that. But you're going to bring in another part. And we also have students in this class that who are interested in more of the training realm or the corporate realm or teachers who are thinking, hey, the consulting gig might be okay for me, you know. Um, and by the way, FYI for some of you, we have some teachers who are leaving teaching and going into um, the edu business world as well, um, full time. So, or people that are, you know, going back and forth. We've had people in the edu business world now going back to the education world um, because of the, what they're doing here. So that's where we are. So we have two people who are going to be interviewing you today. Eric, come on up. And uh, Eric is going to come here, and also Jillian. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put Jillian up there so you can see. There's Jillian, so you can see. Her. And the two are going to be uh, running through the interview questions. Wonderful. And with you, and the questions are primarily going to be taken from the ones that uh, were sent to you or that were that on that document. However, they were modified slightly. So don't be surprised, of course, if you get some, you know, some zingers. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll see what I can do with that. I have right. them open on my other computer, so. Okay, excellent. Got a bunch of things going on. Excellent. All right, so are you evens or odds? I don't remember. Um, I'm odd. Okay, all right. So uh, let me put you up, Ashley. And Jillian, we'll turn it over to you. Hey, hi, Ashley. I'm Jillian. Um, the first question is just, uh, I know you gave us a little bit of a background on what you do, but could you explain it um, a little bit to us, what exactly you do for your job? I, I can try. Um, so I've only been there full-time since mid-March. Yeah, mid-March. Um, and so I can tell you that I'm a learning strategist. And so what happens in my company is... A life science company, particularly usually a pharmaceutical company, will say we're launching a new product or we have um, a medical device that we need people to be trained on, like our sales reps. So they'll send out what's known as an RFP, a request for proposal, and it'll come to our company and we will say, okay, so Ashley, you do e-learning and this looks like it has e-learning in it why don't you help us put together a proposal um, for how we would go about doing this. And then sometimes I'm given things that we have already won the business for and now we say, okay, so we're doing e-learning, now how are we going to do it? And so that's kind of where I step in. Um, so if you think about the Addy model, I kind of do the analysis and design portion of that. Um, I don't do the development and I don't do implementation or evaluation but I might help us think about how there how it will be implemented and will be evaluated and how it will be developed to an extent so that's kind of what I do I do a lot of analysis and design okay awesome this is Eric uh, I'm gonna ask you question two all right how did you become associated with the position that you're working in currently okay. and how did you hear about it um, I didn't hear about it. So what happened was over the summer, I took an internship at an advertising agency, um, McCann Healthcare. So if anyone out there watches Mad Men, they, um, they're kind of a, in the first season, McCann tries to buy out the, uh, the Mad Men's agency. But, uh, so they're a big Madison Avenue uh, place. And they have a specific sector or a specific group of agencies who work on healthcare. So I interned there for the summer. And um, I, I guess I was well liked. And so I went back to Syracuse in the fall and found out that one of my coworkers had left to join the company that I'm at now. And she called me like the second or third day she was on her job and said, I have some consulting work. Would you like to take it? I said, sure. Um, and so I started consulting. Um, that was in October. So by December, she had already asked me what my next steps are career-wise. And I had said, well, I would really like a full-time position somewhere. And she said, OK. And um, I went away for the holidays, and I came back. And she said, well, we have a full-time position for you. 
Um, and so my department within the company is actually fairly new. Um, so she started it in October, right before I got, got there. Um, and so they said, well, we need a learning strategist who knows e-learning and some virtual stuff. So she said, let's hire Ashley. So they created a position for me, and here I am. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Julian, you want to ask question three? Sorry, I just had to flip over to the, the page. I don't have it up. Um, the question three, the question is how many um, learning strategists are employed by uh, your company? So there's me, um, and I do all the e-learning. I also do analytics. Uh, so we have a specific analytics program that we're developing, and I do that. Um, and I also do some ebooks and some gamification. We have another learning strategist here in the US who does product launches, which are really big workshop meetings, like huge workshop meetings. Um, and then we have a third learning strategist in India. He does uh, user experience in gaming. Um, and then we just had someone else join our team who is also in India, and he's doing learning technology. He was a programmer, um, and so he's coming on to help us learn, like, okay, we got these great ideas. Now what can we actually do with the technology we have? So um, he's going to be a great addition to our team. So, And then there's my boss. So there's four of us plus my boss. Okay, Thank you. number four, what is the most challenging part of what you do? Um, well, there's the really mundane answer of billing. <laughs> um, I'm still trying to get used to billing, um, but that's not, I mean, that's just tangential to the job. So I do have to bill every 15 minutes. I have to bill for eight hours a day. Um, and some of that's client work, some of that's internal work, some of that's training. So um, just kind of getting my feet under me there because that's something that's much different in business um, and specifically in agency business. Um, as for what I do, um, I don't know. It's I guess you, you can come up with a really great idea of what you want to do in training and then at the end of the day, say, okay, but there's not the budget for that, or, um, you know, that's not going to be possible in the technology we have. So I guess working within the constraints of the real world would be um, kind of difficult. So uh, that's that can be kind of challenging and sometimes frustrating. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question is, do you have fun at your job? And the second part of that question is, um, why do you think your job is important or necessary to the company? Um, I do have fun at my job. It's it's interesting. I enjoy, I have a pretty quick turnover in projects, which is really nice for me. So I'm not doing the same thing all the time. Um, I'm doing variations of. Sometimes we'll get some new fun projects to work on. Um, and I, I think that it is necessary. We, um, we work as part of, like, we do, we support sales a lot, but we also come up with the learning strategy. Um, and I work closely with some of the content managers and um, the content. Oh, I, I just saw the thing on the side there. Okay, I work with some of the. Um, the content people, so we kind of come up with some ways of doing things, looking at interaction, looking at what the learning experience is going to be, um, and then that allows the content team to really figure out how to fill in what what this outline of the learning experience is. And so it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a lot of hard work some days, so but I do think it's um, it's uh, necessary. And important, so. Thank you. 
Okay, number six. What type of working environment do you prefer? Um, that's a good question. I don't. I don't I'm assuming that means like, um, do you work at home or do you I, work like in the office? I currently work at home. Um, that's because the office is kind of a little bit of a commute for me right now. Um, but I do enjoy the time I spend in the office. Um, it's really nice to be able to talk to some of our, our other employees. Um, I spend a lot of time on the phone, actually, and I spend a lot of time on the phone early, early, early in the morning. Um, so I've got days that start at 7 a.m. with 7 a.m., 7.30 with phone calls. I think my first one tomorrow is 8, so that's not too bad. Um, but we have an uh, office in India who does a lot of our content production. Um, and so I'll be on the phone with them first thing in the morning for because it's a 10 and a half hour difference. Um, but I, I enjoy both working at home and working in the office. Um, so I guess it just depends on what I'm trying to work on. Um, so. We do have a question to like squeeze into it. Okay. Uh, so when I guess when you're in the office, is there something specific you have to wear? I'm sure when you're at home, you can just like wear PJs or something. Um, it, it depends. Uh, if we know, we'll know ahead of time if there's going to be a client in the office or if um, our board of directors are going to be in the office. And in that case, you want to, you know, dress up. But a lot of people wear jeans and t-shirts and um, kind of business casual. So probably not PJs. Um, <laughs> But but business casual is is fine. Uh, so okay. Um, for the next question, then this one's kind of related. So for the people that you work with uh, via phone mostly or online, how do you establish a relationship with them, or what skills do you use to kind of build a relationship when you're working mostly online or via the phone? Do you mean with my colleagues or with um, the with your clients? Sorry. Um, usually, if I meet with clients, I meet with them face to face. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, usually, I travel to wherever the client is and meet with them face to face. So I've been working with two clients on two projects with clients in New Jersey. So I've been going down about every two weeks um, to meet with them. And I don't know when my next one is, um, but then I think right now I'm on a team that's working on a project with a group in Boston. And they're actually going out there next week, and I can't. I'm going away, so <laughs> um, I won't be going with them there. Um, so most of my most of my client work is done in person. I do have weekly status calls, but usually those are only done on the phone anyway for everyone. So that's not an issue really. Um, and then my colleagues, I talk to a lot <laughs> on the phone during the day, um, on email, and we also use Skype a lot. Um, but I haven't I haven't gotten that set up yet on on my work computer, um, and then I'll see them in the office. Whenever I do go down, I I spend significant amount of time with my colleagues, and so that's good. So, so question eight asks: You said you are moving New Jersey. I'm gonna assume it means moving to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Is this a necessity for the job, or is your job one where you could telecommunicate regularly? Um, I could telecommunicate regularly, telecommute regularly, um, and obviously I do telecommute regularly, um, but it is nice to be able to go in the office. It is nice to be able to meet with my boss in the office, um, so that is that is a you know a plus but we do have one employee who telecommutes from Oxford in England my CEO is in Sweden we have someone in Portland wow. and someone on in California somewhere I don't remember where he is um, and I think both of those people are what we call business development managers um, but one of our content people is in Oxford so um, we uh, we all kind of telecommute, and even those people who live in New Jersey, like they don't go into the office every day, which is nice. 
Um, usually everyone shows up on Mondays, and then after that it's whenever you can and or um, would like to after, so. Okay, uh, the next question is, what specific environments are your clients working in? So are you preparing these trainings for in a classroom, an office setting, or, you know, what kind of settings are you usually preparing them for? Well, my clients are all life science industry clients, so they're all pretty much pharmaceutical clients. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, um, my, my role is to work with clients in e-learning and e-books, so usually that would be in their office or um, because a lot of them are sales reps sometimes on the go, like mobile learning, um, but we do also offer product launches and um, things like that which would be or could be um, in a training environment like at a, like a big conference. Um, and so we do a it, it just depends on the project. <laughs> um, so usually not too many classroom except for, for major product launches. So. Thank you. Okay, question 10. You state that you have worked in a K-12 environment as well as in your current position. How do they differ and what strategies are able to be used in both settings? So I did, so while I was at ESU, I did my internship in Lopatcong, which is in New Jersey, in um, a K-12 school. I, I was in specifically the middle school. Um, I'd say, I think, so I'll talk about how they're the same first. Uh, you can use the same strategies for designing and developing, um, you know, a lot of the same theories and models you can use. Um, because they're very flexible like that, right? Um, on the flip side of that, I don't have to do everything. I'm not, I'm not, it's not my job to do the analysis, design, development, implement, and evaluate it. Um, I really focus just on the analysis and design portion. Um, and there's benefits to that for me. Um, but, I mean, there's also benefits to doing it all, right? So, um, so it just depends if you really like having that control and being able to do that. Um, a lot of our stuff is also tied to what our clients need um, and what our clients want. And when you're in the K-12 setting, if you're a teacher, that you are your client. So. Um, so you have a little bit more control there. Um, oh, your students are your clients. <laughs> well, yes, but you're not going to come back and say, well, those look like good learning objectives, but I'm going to change them all now. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote them. You know, you're not, you have a little bit more control, whereas sometimes I'll write learning objectives and the client will be like, mm, no, we're going to change them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I have I have a little less control over it, so um, yeah. So it it just depends on on what you like, how flexible you feel you are. Okay. Um, the next two questions actually um, were my questions, so I'm gonna kind of lump them together because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but. I was wondering if, how prepared did you feel for this job after you finished your education, and um, did you have a lot of very specific training to this job, or was it pretty much like, nope, you know what you're doing, go ahead and do it? She stole my question. Um, okay, did I feel prepared for this job? I mean, in some ways, yes. In other ways, you never really feel prepared for any job when you started, I feel. Um, I'm sure we've all kind of gone through that, like, you get the job and you go, okay, now what am I doing? Uh, and so for me, it's also interesting because I'm the first one in this position. So it's not like, you know, I have people before me who are like, oh, well, this is how we do it, and this is what so-and-so did before they left. You know, I, I am kind of defining my role there, which is nice. Um, specific training. I mean, I, I'm still currently training, kind of. Um, so I try to spend a couple hours a week 
doing onboarding training. Um, so what I do is, like, I obviously know instructional design very well um, and learning strategy, but then I also have to learn all about the pharmaceutical and life science industry and how that works um, because it's a very different type of industry than education. Um, it's a lot about learning who our learners are. So what what kind of learners are sales representatives? What's important to them? Um, so I'm kind of learning a lot about the industry as I go along. And then um, obviously you also have to stay up to date with technology and what's going on in the field, right? So um, I also do some of that reading. Um, and sometimes I'll just get questions that are questions I had never thought about. And so then I have to go, I don't know. Let me go find out. Um, and then I go read for a couple hours and come back and say, well, this is kind of what I think based on what I've been reading. So um, we all kind of do specific training as we go along in addition to what we're doing. So. Okay, so the next question is actually a little kind of similar. Uh, which part of the ID process did you feel was your weakest coming out of ESU, and how have you improved on it? Hmm. Well, I'll say that... <laughs> so the easy answer for me is it was my development skills, but it was not because of ESU. It was just because I'm not that great at development. Um, I don't enjoy development. Um, I do not have the patience to be a good developer. Um, and instead of improving on it, I've just found a position where I don't do it. Um, I understand it. I understand how to do it, but I don't actually develop materials. Um, so there is that. <laughs> um, I've spent, since leaving ESU, I've spent quite a considerable amount of time in research classes and learning how to do research, um, which have, has greatly helped my analysis skills. Um, so I've also kind of bolstered that. And then, in addition, I've always worked on my, my design skills. And so those are kind of ongoing. And so I know things today that I didn't know yesterday that now change how I view design and what, you know, how I might design my next course or the next proposal we get. So, um, yeah, it just, everything. I just, I'm just continually working on everything except development. So, there we go. Okay, well now that we talked about your weakness, uh, what would you say is your greatest professional achievement thus far? I don't think I really have one yet. I mean, I've I've only really been at this position for two months. Um, I mean, I guess I think I guess finding a job and a career that I really enjoy. Um, because if I if if I if I find a job and a career that I really enjoy, that's that right there is a great achievement. Because um, it's very easy to find a career and job that you don't enjoy. So finding finding one that you do, I think, is actually very important. So I'll stick with that. <laughs> okay, the last question we have on the list is 14. What opportunities in the private sector do you hope to open with your doctorate? Absolutely none. Um, so... <laughs> And Beth will attest to this. I didn't start my doctorate to open, like, to make more money or to, to, you know, increase my job opportunities or anything like that. I started this because I said, well, I was having a conversation with Beth one day, and she said, Ashley, you should consider your doctorate. And I was like, Beth, there's nothing in my life that I love enough to try to go for a doctorate in. Um, and then I took what at the time was MCOM 530, which I, I guess is no longer MCOM 530 as you've all changed your name. Um, and I found instructional design for effective learning, and I really loved it. And I said, okay, I love this enough to spend the next 
X amount of years of my life trying to study this more in depth. And so I really went into my doctorate hoping to make myself a better practitioner and to um, grow my skills and to learn more. So for me, it was never like about opening doors. Now, um, that being said, it has opened opportunities for me, right? So because I was in a doctorate program, I applied for this internship over the summer, and I got it. Um, and that has led me to where, where I am right now. Sorry, that's my husband in the background. Hi, Jason. Oh. <laughs> um, so it has it has opened opportunities for me, but um, I didn't go into it thinking that um, that that's what I was attempting to do. If that makes sense. Um, so there we go. Does anybody have any other random questions for Ashley? I mean, she's on a, a nice path. Um, you can see that uh, her she has worked with so many pe different kinds of people all over. Um, and also, by the way, thank you, Ashley, or not thank you, um, Jillian and Eric, very much for facilitating the questions. But does anybody else have anything else for Ashley? Like I said, she just came back from Korea. By the way, she was there over. Holidays? Kind of the holiday break. Yeah, we left um, December 24th. So, Aww. yeah. Aww. You said you wanted to see one, so here's one. Yay. I didn't know it was a long hair. Yeah, we have a long hair and a short hair. Aww. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, Very cute. Does anyone else have any questions, though, for Ashley? And what is she doing in Korea? Um, I don't know if you heard. Come on up here, Zhao Yun, so she can see you. I mean, I could repeat her question, but it's it's nicer if she sees you. Go ahead. Uh, maybe I didn't catch that. Um, I want to ask, what did you do in Korea? Just for vacation? Um, sort of. So my sister is currently teaching at an international high school, um, outside of Incheon. And so we, we being my grandmother and my husband, who just left to pick up a computer, and I, we went over to visit her. Oh, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was a nice trip. It was a long, long trip, like a long, long plane ride, but it was good. So. Yeah. How long did you stay there? Two weeks. We were there um, from December 25th until January 8th, I think, or 7th, something like that. So it was good. It was fun. You know, Ashley, talking about those cultural issues, cultural issues, and you said that you have your someone in Oxford, two people in India, and one in Sweden um, <laughs> from different, you know, distinctly different cultures. Of course, we all have our individual cultures that we're from. But is there something that that stands out in your mind that you need to keep in mind other than time change? <laughs> and and GMT, where are, where are you on that clock? Um, but other than that, when you think about working across uh, these cultural boundaries? Um, so one thing I learned today is always check the office calendar when setting up meetings. Because <laughs> I set up a meeting for Friday, but Friday is a holiday in Pune. Oh, oh how about that? OK. Um, and so I got a very nice email back from, from one of the men um, mm -hmm. who said, we'd love to, but um, it is. Maharashtra Day in India. Okay. So <laughs> we have we have that off, and I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I should have checked the calendar, because we have a calendar where we have all of the um, the holidays for the UK and India and the US." Excellent. Um, so I need to be better about that. Um, otherwise, um, my I was talking to my boss, and I found out that. One of the things we're always asked by our our colleagues in India is how's the weather, because it changes so frequently here, and I guess it doesn't do that as much in Pune. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's fascinating that <laughs> we talk about the weather as much as we do. Um, so I liked that. 
Um, otherwise, it's it's also being very clear because so when I was at McCann, like if I needed something done by the the creative team, I could just walk down the hall, stand next to someone, and say, "I did this drawing. Mm -hmm. How can we make it nice? Like, you know, how can I make this not look like I drew it mm. on the back of a napkin or whatever?" Um, in India, like I can still do that, and I'll send over a scanned version of whatever I I did. Um, but it's a lot harder for me to be like, "Oh, go ahead and take control of it." Like, I'll get something back that's very like if I'm if I misspell words on it, like it's very oh. exactly as I did it, and that's fine. Like because there's not that communication. Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing about that though is that for our clients, there's like someone working full time on their projects. Hmm. Much, um, because as I'm going to bed here, <laughs> like I can send things at my end of day, and they'll get to India their beginning of day. Mm -hmm. And they'll send them back their end of day, which is my beginning. So we have kind of almost a 24-hour model going on there. How interesting. Talking about rapid prototyping, right? Yeah. Um, very interesting. Oh, by the way, I think the other thing that you said, can you can you say the thing about the little boxes? Remember little that you said this when we talked about the diagrams, the concept maps? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you remember doing where you had to draw out those. OK, go ahead. <laughs> So, a few weeks ago, I was working on creating learning objectives for a marketing project. And I'm sitting there, and I'm doing them. And I have my goal at the top, and then I've got my learning objectives, and then I've got all my tasks leaning, leading up to them. And I had a moment, and I said, why am I doing this? Why do I do this? I know this is what I do. I know this is how I do it. But I don't remember why I do it this way. Um, and so I then had a, the opportunity, I was looking for something else, and I was going through the, the Dick and Carrie book, which is on the floor by my feet, which I can't pick up right now. And uh, I realized as I opened to a, a bookmarked page that, oh, I do this because that's what I learned in Beth's class. Like, that's how we do it. <laughs> which, by the way, the Dick and Carrie book I still use. Like, it's sitting at my feet now, and I can't really bend down anymore to get it. Um. <laughs> I told them you're pregnant, just for those yeah. of you who are, are online. She's pregnant. That's why she can't get it. <laughs> I, I tried that today, and that didn't really work for me. Um, so what I need to do is have my husband grab all the four or five books at my feet and put them up on my desk. Um, so I can't really bend down and get it. But it's actually a book that I still use. Um, so it's a great resource for those of you who are using it. Highly recommended. Very good. <laughs> and, at, and I told you, this is the book that I disliked the most, I think, out of all my books of the doctor program. It's the one that I use the most after I graduated. It's kind of weird. All right, so um, Casey, uh, I, what Jillian said, was it Jillian? Jillian said she had another question. Yeah. Um, and I, I, maybe you said this already, but I wasn't sure. Can you explain, what was your, um, what were the steps that took to get you there? Like, what was your undergrad, graduate, and mm -hmm. then you finished your graduate and you were doing an internship and then you got hired, um, but you're already in a doctoral program. Can you just explain that and what your majors were? Sure. So I did my undergraduate at a small liberal arts college in New Jersey called Drew University, and I was graduating in 2010 with a bachelor's in cultural anthropology and French literature. French. French literature, yes. And I'm not sure how many of you remember the job climate in 2010, but it wasn't looking great. And it wasn't really looking great for those of us who were graduating with cultural anthropology degrees or French literature degrees. Like, great things to learn, don't get me wrong, just not that marketable at that time. So throughout the last three years of college, I had been working at the, what was then known as the faculty lab. And I was working for a woman, or with a woman named Sarah Ashley. And she said, oh, what are you going to do after you graduate, Ashley? And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> she said, well, you're really good at instructional technology, and you really seem to like it. Why don't you apply to a program for it? And I said, oh, like what? 
And she said, well, I went to this program at East Stroudsburg University. It's not that far away. And the coordinator is named Beth Sackman, and she happens to be coming in next week to check up on one of the interns, so I'll introduce you. And I said, great. So it was a partic particularly bad day for me. I remember that. And I'm wearing, like, ripped jeans and, like, a T-shirt, and I'm sitting in the faculty lab doing work, and Beth comes in, and Sarah introduces me, and I'm really embarrassed because I, I, I didn't look, you know, like I'm ready to talk to anyone about graduate school. Um, but then I applied, and I ended up going to East Stroudsburg. Um, and then Beth had her conversation with me about, about my doctorate, and I said, Beth, you're crazy, and <laughs> I remember this very well. And she said, no, no, think about it. And I found instructional design, and I loved it. Um, and then I started applying to programs. So if any of you are thinking about applying to doctoral programs, I can also talk to you about that and that experience. Uh, I ended up applying to three, and I ended up choosing to go to Syracuse. Um, little known fact, graduate programs do not pay you that well. Um, and at Syracuse, you don't get paid over the summer. So over the summer, I did find a paid internship at working at McCann. So I got married. We took a week for our honeymoon. I came back and had three or four days where I was packing, and then I left for three months to move down to New Jersey and follow this internship. Um, and then I came back in the fall, and I finished my classes. And this semester, I've been thinking a lot about my dissertation. Um, and so that's kind of where I am. So I hope that answers your, <laughs> your question. So, And we have another question coming in right here. Okay. This is Eric again. Um, I had a question about whether or not you're planning on doing something else, or do you see yourself staying in this position until retirement? Or <laughs> I don't know. Like, Is this something like yeah. a stepping stone? Um, as, that's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about that, actually. Um, I see myself here for a considerable amount of time. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about agency life is that we live kind of quarter to quarter. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is that. Um, so at least for the time being, I see myself staying at this at this agency for as long as I see myself doing anything. Um, I am under a non-disclosure and a non-compete. So for two years, like if I were to leave the company I'm at for two years, I'm not allowed to work for another company that does similar things. And they've, they've outlined in my contract what that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have to change <laughs> career paths at some point. Um, I could stay in technology, or I could stay in um, instructional design, but I wouldn't necessarily be able to do it for life science companies. I could go somewhere else. I could go back to higher ed. Um, I'm not certified, so I probably couldn't do K-12 easily. Um, but there we go. So uh, that's a question I'm I'm interested to finding out the answer to. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Anyone? Any other questions before we close up? Well, actually, just I don't think we I mentioned this to you, but I am working with a school uh, that's developing called the the School of Kirkridge. If anyone wants to look it up, and in this school, the students will be designing their own objectives. Oh, very nice. So you know, it's totally uh, backwards. It's it is a will be a K through eight school to begin with, um, and they've of course pulled me on there. So I think the press release either went out today or it's going to go out tomorrow. One of those two. Um, Spell it back. The School of Kirkridge. It's right next to Columcile here in um, around Bangor Mountain. Hopefully, all of you have been to Columcile. Have you been to Col? Okay, when you come back to the Poconos, we're taking you to Columcile. Although Jazz and I like to go there with our swords, just so you know, it's supposed to be meditative. We take our swords. It's we go in the inside part because it's. Would, have you gone to Columcile? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know the little castle thing. Doesn't that just scream? You need to do sword. Yeah. Nerf swords. Nerf swords. You know nerf swords, of course. So, in any case, um, yeah, someday we'll have to do a filter for everybody who didn't go to Column Style. But anyway, Kirkridge is right next to Column Style. And um, uh, so it's kind of this group of people have gotten together who wanted to start a school. And that's not like any other private school out there. It combines the Sunbury Method, the um, Montessori, 
and a little bit of uh, Parker Palmer and some of the work in there. So it's it's going to be a school where the students drive things. So in math and reading, there will be certain levels that you expect kids, children to get to, but and students. But then after that, it will be very project based, um, where the students actually design the projects and pick them out and that kind of thing. So we'll have our first parent meeting in. I think May, I'll tell you about it next week actually, because if any of you want to attend the parent meetings and just see what's going on and see what parents are thinking and what are people are asking and you know that kind of thing, it's all very interesting. So that's that's our fun project. But yeah. so, there you go. All right, so um, any more questions? Well, thank you so much, Ashley, yeah. for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Can, can we give a round of applause? Yeah, okay, thank you. In here. Um, and we're going to let you go, Ashley. We're going to continue because we have to have the rest of our our class, and I have I have to take questions, you know, because they they I do design the objectives for this course, and so they do get a grade, uh, and uh, and so I'm sure they'll be uh, anxious to find out, you know, what I'm looking for. All right, that's always a good thing to do. All right, a ton. Bye. See you later. Bye. All right. Okay, so thank you, all of you. I'm going to keep broadcasting just because um, uh, Thomas will watch the recording, and so it's better if I have it all in there, because otherwise we have to split back to collaborate, and what a pain that will be. So this will just allow him to watch the whole thing. All right. Um, and Cybell, just so you know, um, if you're listening to me, it took me a while to figure out that that's like a picture. For a long time, I thought you were just standing still. <laughs> I was moving at first, and then I froze it. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's smart. It was just... It cracked me up. <laughs> it was so funny. So it did. All right. Um, uh, so it did. Did you learn something? From talking to Ashley? Yeah? Yeah, we don't have a thumbs up, thumbs down here, but um, for those of you who didn't see uh, online, what I would like you to do, I think the on-site people saw the chats. Um, yeah, J Jillian, I did get worried when she didn't play for so long. I was I was like, is she sick? Is she okay? Um, and then I realized, ha, ah, yeah, okay. Um, but those of you who uh, did not see this, um, what I just asked is that you go in and answer one question out of all the questions on that document. I think there are five questions left, or you can just write an impression that you had on there. And I was just wondering, you know, before we close up the interview, was there anything that stood out in your mind during the interview that you're like, you know, that was interesting? So, go ahead, Brianna. It is. And for those of you who didn't hear, Brianna said that uh, she found it amazing that she only did concentrate on the first steps of the design process. Yes. When you go corporate, that is very common. Very common. And when you go on the corporate realm. Higher ed, even when you're at the higher ed realm, um, if you're running something like World Campus, okay, which is out of Penn State, World Campus, um, what's the one out of the UK? Phoenix? I think World Campus Phoenix, and what's the other one? Ay, yeah, yeah, University of Phoenix. But the one on Open Open University? I think the Open University. At, at those higher ed institutions, many times it is segregated like that. Also, there is a company that has started, and I have to go look up the name again. And one of our graduates was hired by this company that actually creates content for higher ed. But this company, the for profit company, runs the courses, they run the advising, they run the like the whole admissions pro they basically are a university, but they're for profit, but they pair up with not for profit. So it's paired up with Stanford, it's paired up with all these other big places running certain programs. And in those programs they'll also be segregated out. And so that the pieces like you'll do either the development or the analysis or the evaluation or something. Very high profile programs. What's that? Are they big No, no, no. They're programs. Okay. They are like, this is the medical school. Well, they don't know if they do the medical school. But like, this is a law school. It's high profile. Where people are going to pay a lot of money for the degree. I mean, not, not gen eds, you know. Because gen eds mainly, it's the instructor again doing the whole thing. Unless, unless I wonder if some of those high profile schools have an agreement 
with those as well. Because like art history, you could do art history online, you know. Yeah. There's certain. Like a lot of the it could be done that way, yeah, I think so. So um, I think there's going to be, a prediction, there's going to be more and more of it, mm -hmm. right, when it, when it intersects with gaming, that there'll be more of that for the lower level skills, and for the higher level skills, like here where you're designing, that's where, that's where it won't happen, because yeah. that's when you need the instructor looking at your work and giving you feedback, and you need that relationship to find out people's strengths. But some of the other offloading things, I think, will happen. I think eventually, I think uh, I've, those of you in here, John was talking about the um, pulling out the qualitative and quantitative concepts because there are certain things you could definitely offload, you know, and have it automated, like in what you're doing. And there are certain things also that you want to spend the time yeah. doing. And they're time intensive, right? It is, and it's very time intensive as you're finding out now to really do it well. You know, to really make that that self-paced learning run so smoothly, it's a lot of time. And when you're teaching so many courses at one time, it takes you a long time, a long time to build up to it. Yes, if yes, if you have the right people involved and the right players, it is scalable for sure. Yep. Good. Any, any more questions? I mean, this is kind of the important part of where the hard whole field is going. And and by the way, I say higher ed. Yes, higher ed is changing more swiftly, but in K, K twelve it is as well. Um, anybody here do virtual charter schooling? I don't know. Virtual charter schools like K twelve Inc. You don't, do you do blend? I know we had somebody in blended schools, but that was in the other class. Jillian, Casey, do anybody? Okay. Um, if you look at K-12 Inc., K-12 Inc. is the online charter school that was started by William Bennett, um, who was the Secretary of Education under Reagan, I believe. Um, in any case, he pulled together all these fabulous, great minds. I don't think highly of him, just so you know, at all. Um, but, but, what's that? I am, but that's okay. He can know I don't. I don't think I leave him. By the way, he got he got he got, he got charged with drug, drug abuse charges for I think painkillers. You know, I, I don't know why people want painkillers. Whatever. So, but regardless, um, uh, I can be on record to say I do not love Rush Limbaugh, and he was a Rush Limbaugh lover, and I am not. So there you go. <laughs> okay, I can be on record for that. Um, my dad and I always used to argue about though, because my dad was a card carrying, money giving Republican. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, in any case, um, uh, that's what they did with K twelve Inc. They did a lot of fabulous things. I mean, I have to say, you know, he put together a brilliant team, or whoever it was. I don't know if he was just the figurehead or what. Brilliant team of people to make this curriculum that was so robust that did exactly what you said, John. Basically, took the concepts that could be automated and automated them and took the other ideas that had to go deeper that needed hands on learning and gave them that gave them that. And he brought together people from Stanford and Oxford and, and Harvard and all these fabulous instructors um, to try to figure that out. You know, and, and they did that. So uh, you know it can be done. It can be and then the kids saw how much they accomplished each week and could see where their end goal was. So the kid, the children already automatically knew where they were and the kids loved it. Oh yeah, there was gaming, all kinds of things integrated. So, And I don't know where it stands now, this is back in 2004. Mm -hmm. Wow! Oh my word, because that's when I was researching it. Okay, um, long time, wow, it's a long time ago now. Alright. And any other thoughts or questions, you know, or something that stood out to you of when we interviewed Ashley today? No. Okay, what I think I'm going to do right now then is, because um, we're past our time, um, I think the online people, I think everything is there that you need for my online group. Um, the only thing I would say, I want to do something before you go, if you can. Um, next week we will have some things to do, though they'll, they'll be minor. One will be a test. But the test is not for grade, it's for completion. Because I want to see, if, remember the pretest that you did? I want to do a post-test and I just want to see. Just want to see what you got, what you did. Okay? And it's not a grade though, it's for me. So you don't have to study for it. Okay? It's actually for me only. Um, 
that's one thing. The other thing that you'll see today is you're going to see a bunch of surveys for bunches of feedback. Next week there will even be another one. Okay, so beware of that. Um, that's one thing. Now, I have two questions for you that we all need to vote on. Okay. The first question is uh, the, the dispositions. If you remember, I gave you all that link for you to give to some sort of subject matter expert or SME to do. Um, was everybody able to get somebody to do that? I didn't look at the results yet. No? No? Okay. Yes or no? Okay. What I'm going to do, if you can, try to get the person to do something by the end of the week. If not, I'm going to start sending results out to you of the ones that I have. They should have typed your name in there, you know, if they were doing this for you, so that I'm just going to send it to you. Okay? I'm just going to basically copy it and send it to you. I'm not going to, actually, I might do a, a, a mail merge to send them to you. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, next week, next week, do we want to meet or not? Really, what we have to do next week is do the, um, the quiz. I want to give you a professional development sheet so you know what's coming up so you can be thinking about that. Um, and also, I will have, I think I already have them open for you, some uh, proposals that were done so you can see how something could be used for consulting purposes or something like that, some examples. Um, and I thought that would be beneficial to you. But I can also do that in a screencast, okay, because they're actually up there and I could show them to you. Um, and it's just more of an FYI. So the question is, do we want to meet? Because we really, we don't have to, we can post everything up on the web. And your projects are almost done. It's that time. We are going to meet in 510, which is a Thursday night class, because we didn't meet for two weeks. But for this class, we have met every Wednesday the semester. We didn't even get snowed out. I know, with all the snow. So what are your thoughts? Do you want this to be our last class? What's that? Sad, but we should. It's sad if you think we should, people at a distance. <laughs> if, if, if this is our last class, what I would like to do is put up a discussion board. I don't have it up yet. I'll just do it you know, in a few minutes after class. Where that all of you can share your final product with everybody. So that everybody can see what you decide will be the final product. And you will see people. I'm going to go through it with the people who are um, on site here. But you will see that for the assignment that is due next week, you get to choose which one you want. Okay, you get to choose your D2L project or this project that you just did as your final project. And what I would do, like I said, is I would make a discussion board so that when you upload it, everybody can see everybody else's work for nothing more than curiosity. See all the cool stuff that you did. Because I was looking at your, you know, your development right now and what you did for the materials, the part that Ashley did not like to do, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys were fabulous. You were just fabulous, um, the ones that I looked at. So I do want you to see each other's work. I really do. Uh, and I think that'd be good. So, are you are you okay with not meeting next week? Okay, the people who are on, on site, they're saying they're okay. Are you okay at a distance? Mm -hmm. Kelly, where are you? Are you thumbs up? Isabel yeah, <laughs> Sabelle, would you blink? <laughs> I can't figure it out. Okay. <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. Very good. You might cry depending on the decision. Aww. Okay. Well, and you know what? For some reason, um, Kelly never made it. Oh, bling! Darn it! So I have I I had the bling. So I have bling for Laura. And and uh, Kelly, right? Didn't you have something, Kelly? Okay. Um. I have a funny bling. What's that? That's a Zhao Yan. Oh, that's right. So I have four. I was thinking I had three. Man. All right. Well, um, I'll have to put them out to you guys, and you'll have to answer who wants what. That's why you were going to cry. Yeah, that's it, Laura. She thought you wouldn't get her bling. Well, just so you know, one of the choices that I have for you, it's in my, it's in my bag. I forgot I don't bring my bag over here, and I'm not going to go make you run in and get it. But I'm going to tell you what it is in case any of you want it. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. 
It's a face mask. Wait, it's a face mask from Korea, given to me from Ashley, made out of snails. <laughs> it's very famous. Yeah. Zhang Yen wants it. Does anybody else want this snail mask? No? <laughs> what do you think, Kelly? What do you think, <laughs> Laura? All right. <laughs> well, apparently this is very famous, so I will go get it so everybody can see it. And I will give it to you, and you don't have to hang around. But it's like in this little, it's in this gold package. <laughs> so I will, I will give it. To, Ashley, I will tell Ashley that you got it and that you're very excited and she will be so excited. It's the star in Korea. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's very famous. And it's yes. So I'll give it to you. Yeah, yeah. See, Jaya knows how expensive. She knows quality. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So excellent. Just email me if you have anything. Um, your case study should be due, your formative evaluation should be due. If for some reason they're not up, you know, or you're confused, let me know. I will be around. It's not like I'm leaving the country. So just get me if you need me. And for those of you who I won't see online again, mwah, I will miss you and it was awesome learning with you guys and awesome seeing your products. Okay? We'll see you later. All right, stop.